So I'm basically here to warm up the scene for the next speaker, Lucas Stenson, a young man I met in a, in a queue in front of a bakery in front of Scratch Bread at bed two years ago. So I will try to do this uh, as, as um, quick as I can um, and yet try to keep it somehow uh, meaningful. I am from a country where ascetic doctors and Puritan priests have led a 300-year-long anti-hedonistic crusade against the pleasure-giving qualities of food and against sensuality as such. For centuries in Denmark, the idea of preparing wonderful meals for your loved ones was considered a sin in line with theft, abuse of alcohol, exaggerated dancing, and masturbation. <laughs> the um, philosophy so successfully communicated by these fine people was that if you want to live a long and healthy life on earth and avoid going to hell, what you have to do is to eat something of inferior taste and get it over with in a hurry. It was in this spirit that I was uh, brought up in a middle-class family in the 60s, the darkest period of Danish food history. My mother, Ulla, represented the first generation of Danish women working outside the home. It was an era, that was her luck, an era of canned meatballs and potato powder, of sauce coloring, uh, and of the stock cube. My parents literally raised me on a diet composed of chopped fatty meat and the frozen vegetables pre-boiled many years before in exotic places like Kazakhstan, Romania, and Poland. It was all stocked in massive chest freezers in our basement. So at the age of 15, I weighed 100 kilos, and I was one of the three fattest kids in the region. Eating, uh, eating, as you may recall, in my childhood was never a matter of reaching out for the beauty of life. It was a matter of economical efficiency, food should be cheap, and prepared and eaten in less than 30 minutes. Those 19 years spent in some sort of culinary darkness was contrasted by one year spent in a culinary paradise in Agen, the capital of Gascony in southern France, where I happened to work as an au pair with a couple of marvelous people who couldn't have... Children always had wanted to have a son, and my parents were divorced when I was 14, so kind of we were a pretty nice fit. And the short story is that um, I came back to Denmark at the age of 20 with a calling. I wanted to try to change the food culture of my country um, to defend the concept of the family and love. Uh, so I ran around for almost 20 years uh, of my adult life and built food companies with a certain success, but without in the last picture impacting much. Then at uh, the beginning of this millennium, I came across writing a book about Spanish food, a couple of Spanish chefs in the Basque country, who um, basically succeeded in transforming Spanish cuisine within less than 25 years. Also, I was highly inspired by the Danish dogma filmmakers who, in the late 90s, under the leadership of Lars von Trier, launched their manifesto that, for more than a moment, at least in Europe, changed the dynamics of filmmaking. So, influenced by these ex experiences, I got the very simple idea that instead of running around like some sort of a maniac, uh, trying almost single-handedly to repair on every single imperfection of our food culture, I could maybe take a, a different um, top-down approach and uh, share the somewhat outrageous idea that maybe one day the Danish food culture could be counted amongst the greatest ones in the world. Eventually, we decided to do three things. One was to open up a restaurant called Noma uh, that would explore ancient Nordic cooking techniques and work solely with local produce, which at that time was a very strange idea. Uh, the other thing we did was to start exploring that if one day our food culture should be counted amongst the most delicious, respected, and admirable ones in the world, which value should then define our journey um, and become a guiding light for all the stakeholders that would eventually be involved in that project. The third thing we did was to start discussing uh, how should the vehicle look like? The vehicle that should efficiently disseminate those values, that belief system into people's lives 
and engage the most important stakeholders in uh, creating this sort of shift of uh, paradigm so that eventually it could all grow bottom up. This was how we ended up writing the Nordic Cuisine Manifesto and, and kind of uh, building the first blocks in what later was to become known as the New Nordic Cuisine Movement. I never saw the New Nordic Cuisine as just a matter of promoting the virtues and the cuisines and the chefs of our own region or as a simple search for culinary excellence in some sort of a star chef race. You all know that the Vikings burned down the European villages and raped their women. I like to believe that the New Nordic Cuisine is different, a different animal. I like to believe that uh, the New Nordic Cuisine is not a declaration of war against French food or Italian pizza, that it is not a crusade against sushi or Moroccan tagine, that if there is one enemy, then it is the international junk and fast food industry dominated by massive corporations that ruin our health, undermine our independence and damage potentially our planet. In 2009, Jan Krau Jakobsen, who co-authored the manifesto process with me, called me up and told me that he had reread the manifesto and come to the conclusion that you can actually leave out the word Nordic from the, war from the Nordic Cuisine Manifesto. And um, I found that quite interesting because I, was, I always try to you know, search for a deeper meaning with everything. So eventually I based on that idea, made the decision to establish a foundation in 2010, the Melting Pot Foundation, based on the idea to help vulnerable and marginalized people through projects that have food, deliciousness, and entrepreneurship as recurrent elements. Um, Jan and I basically wanted to try to make a copy of everything that had worked in Denmark and in Scandinavia and give that away to a poor country. And we ended up in Bolivia. We ask ourselves the question, can you combat poverty with deliciousness? Why Bolivia? Well, Bolivia is the poorest country of South America. 26% of the population live under the UNDP level of poverty. I don't know if that is worse or better than America. Uh, one out of three poor people are unemployed. We have a country with the largest unexplored biological diversity worldwide and a country with a lack of self-confidence, a country that has lost all wars and most football matches in more than 150 years. With another Danish not-for-profit, we, in together we built a restaurant, uh, Gusto, based on an old Danish apprenticeship model, um, in order to have an excuse to teach young boys and girls from the slums to cook. Um, and um, we launched a we, we, we became some sort of an enzyme that helped uh, Bolivians from all the countries get together and formulate a Bolivian food manifesto. Um, and um, we also, I mean, basically Camila and Michelangelo, the two young people up there in the left corner, they, they executed this project so well that they were approached by a Dutch NGO, ECO, who kind of co-financed uh, no less than 13... Uh, small cafeterias directly in the slums of El Alto, where 2,500 kids will, by the end of this year, have been given a, a small um, cook or front of house uh, diploma inspired by the learnings um, of uh, Gusto. I don't know the end game in Bolivia. Um, and the project is, even though it's not very expensive, this has been very expensive to execute. Um, but, but it is not, I have to say that it is not totally economically sustainable at this point of time. Um, but it is fair to say that we have, with a very, with, with, well, with this effort, we have definitely um, impacted a number of people's lives. And um, there is a fair chance that, that one day what we've been doing in Bolivia will mean more to the Bolivian people and their destiny than Norma has ever meant to anyone in Scandinavia. And also, uh, this has been maybe the most personally rewarding journey I've ever embarked on. Then in 2015, I, well, actually, and then another nice little story, Gusto was voted number 17 of the list of Latin America's 50 best and as the first social project ever to enter that list. And this is Camila, the head chef. And then I 
happened to move to America to live in New York. I, I basically now live in New York with my wife, my three girls, and our two dogs. And we came here to establish in the Vanderbilt Hall of Grand Central Terminal a food hall with a bakery, an open rye sandwich station, a bar, a, a, a vegetable-driven pavilion, and a number of other small, funny food places and a restaurant. Um, we have started growing grain in Connecticut, Nordic heirloom grain varieties, smoking salmon, roasting coffee in Brooklyn, and, and we just try to, to get the best out of it. But um, I think the most interesting thing that I have ran into here organically in New York is the man you will, that will take over from me here on the scene now, a young guy called Lucas, um, that, that one day uh, mentioned uh, the community of Brownsville to me. So with these words and further ado, Lucas Denton. Good morning, Bitten, uh, and thank you, Klaus, for that introduction. Um, so Brownsville is a fascinating community. Uh, it was originally established in the 1880s in Brooklyn. It's in between Crown Heights and East New York, for those of you who don't know, um, as a kind of a pressure release valve for the Lower East Side. So for the first 70 years of its existence as a neighborhood, it was an almost totally Jewish neighborhood. Um, Brownsville is one of the few neighborhoods in New York City that has always been a ghetto uh, since its inception. Today, Brownsville is doing far better than it has previously. In 1993, its homicide rate was 87 per 100,000, which is uh, extremely high. Uh, and today, it's about 23 per 100,000. So it's gone down significantly, and they've made a lot of progress. However, Brownsville still generally, you know, on a yearly basis has the highest homicide rate in New York City. Um, one out of every five people in Brownsville report eating no fruits or vegetables a day. It's an incredibly poverty-stricken neighborhood. It's got the highest death rates of all causes, heart disease, diabetes, hyperta uh, hypertension, cancer. Um, so it's a neighborhood in crisis. Uh, a third of the people in Brownsville live on less than $15,000 a year. 55% of the people there have one or more forms of public assistance. 60% uh, of the housing stock in Brownsville is public housing, making it the largest concentration of public housing in North America. And uh, they also have the lowest rate of educational achievement of any neighborhood in New York City. So they're having a hard time, needless to say. Um, but what we found when we went in the neighborhood was that the people there have this spirit of enterprise and grit that rivals some of the most successful people that we'd ever met. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about those people. But this really informed uh, and has since the onset of our program how we've approached the neighborhood and how we felt that we should go about developing the programming. Um, and we want to make use of the resource which is going to be most effective at making change in the neighborhood, which is not us, which is not the New Nordic Cuisine philosophy, which isn't uh, having access to the, all of the culinary knowledge in the world. It's going to be the people of Brownsville who will make this change. So in 2013, I, uh, I live in Bed-Stuy. I was uh, coming from a thing I go to on Saturdays with a buddy of mine, and he got a flat tire. And uh, so we parked in front of this bakery, Scratch Bread, in Brooklyn. I don't know if some of you know, but it was fantastic. It no longer exists, unfortunately. So I was helping my friend change this tire, and I hear, uh, hear somebody talking in some weird elfin language, um, wildly gesticulating, looking kind of nervous with his family online at this, uh, at this bakery. And I figured I should probably go welcome this guy to the neighborhood and, and, and you know, help him feel at ease. So uh, turns out it was Klaus. I'd never heard of Klaus before. <laughs> The only thing I'd ever heard about Noma was a few weeks I'd read a blurb on my BBC app that there had been a food poisoning outbreak at the world's best restaurant. Um, so I didn't know anything. Uh, but he's like, I'm a restaurateur. I'm going to be moving to New York City to do a, a project. But I'm really interested in, in doing a project in, in New York. And uh, at the time, I was working with the New York City Commission on Human Rights doing a study of the racial dynamics of the rental housing market. So it was kind of on the front lines of gentrification uh, professionally observing that process unfold, and then personally living in Bed-Stuy, watching a lot of my neighbors move out, and uh, the neighborhood changed rapidly. Um, he described to me the project in Bolivia, creating this phenomenal destination restaurant, a social project that was really helping the community, but I, I noted at that point that, you know, putting a fancy restaurant in a struggling neighborhood in New York City is not always the best way to help out the people who are there that are struggling. 
And, uh, and uh, Klaus said to me, really, explain to me more, uh, rather than be offended, which I thought was impressive. So we talked a little bit, and I gave him my email address, and I meet and talk to crazy people in lines all the time in New York City, so I never thought I would hear from him again. Uh, but the very next day, he sent me an email with a long list of questions, like really searching questions about inequality in America and how could we do something to actually make a difference. And uh, so we came, we've come up with this idea of the Brownsville Community Culinary Center. How we got there, um, in August of 2014, I went in and I first met with the community board and I asked them, what does Brownsville need? They introduced me to a variety of people throughout the neighborhood who I met with and asked them the same question. And eventually we came upon a woman named Brenda Duchesne, who I think is doing a, you know, work that is you know, far more impressive than any work we'll do. Um, which she's a resident of Brownsville. She's from Aruba. She's lived there for 30 years. She runs five community gardens, after school programs, culinary demonstrations. She's doing amazing work. Um, so we started working with her closely and getting her input on how we should develop this. We participated in something called a health impact assessment, which is an analytic tool that measures the potential efficacy uh, of programs. And through that process, we held uh, almost a dozen community meetings um, in which we got input from all the various stakeholders. And then in the in the fall of 2014, we held a community meeting where we kind of presented our proto idea. And, uh, you know, we thought people would be far more interested in having access to fresh, healthy foods um, than they were. Because what we heard from people then at that point was, we want jobs. We need jobs. And we were very aware that, you know, having surveyed other programs in neighborhoods like Brownsville, uh, you know, you can put all the fresh, healthy vegetables in a neighborhood that you want, and a lot of times people aren't going to buy it. Sometimes people have forgotten what to do with them. Sometimes people can't afford them. Sometimes people don't have time to cook. So there are a lot of systemic factors. So we realized we would need to take a little bit more of a systemic approach and approach the economics of the neighborhood as well. So the Brownsville Community Culinary Center is going to have a restaurant. It's going to have a cafe and it's going to have a bakery uh, where we'll mill the flour on site. We're even putting a coffee roastery in the basement to give out a couple of extra jobs to people from Brownsville. Additionally, we're going to have a culinary education program for students from Brownsville. It'll be a 12-month program made up of four discrete modules, each of which comes with its own skill set so that when people, if we were expecting uh, about a 60% attrition rate, we, we hope that won't happen, but that's par for the course for programs in the neighborhood. So that if people are only able to, for the, you know, based on their life circumstances, complete three months, six months, they'll be able to leave with a specific set of skills and still be able to uh, enter the culinary field at some level. Um, and it's a paid apprenticeship. So we're actually, the students will pay no tuition whatsoever. Um, we will raise the money for their, for their tuition. And they'll be paid $10.50 an hour to work in the kitchen in the restaurant while they're learning. Um, and another thing we found out too, so we asked what kind of food do you want? And people were like, well, we want the, the things other neighborhoods have, Thai food, Japanese food. But you gotta get the classics right. Um, so like, how the hell are we going to do that? Uh, Denmark, me, you know, I don't know anything about the foods that people in Brownsville are eating. Right now, it's mostly, there's a single sit-down restaurant with table service, which we will definitely be providing, but there's all kinds of fast food and everything. So we've developed this model where we're looking into the cuisine of the African diaspora that we sourced through the program at the Senior Center in Brownsville, um, where we had seniors tell us about their diets and uh, we've developed a model in which we'll be able to provide a 50% discount to anybody with SNAP benefits. Um, and that comes from the profit that the restaurant makes then funds that discount. So the, the food is available uh, to everybody in the neighborhood. Um, and our eventual hope is that we, once again, like the New Nordic Cuisine Movement, spark, uh, spark something that will have an impact outside of our walls and really energize the community to get interested in cooking and eating healthy again. Thank you.